Yes, yes. Welcome to the ancient world of tabletop games. I am Agamemnon from the historical documentary Time Bandits. This is a report from a fugitive. No, I don't do unboxing videos. Leaving aside the fact that this channel's first video was an unboxing video, of course. And I don't buy bricks of role-playing accessories. Uh, this is a brick of figures for the role-playing game Pathfinder. Fantasy-themed miniatures are useful for fantasy-themed games of any system, whether Dungeons & Dragons or its Frankensteinian offspring, Pathfinder. When buying figures, I prefer to know what I'm buying. Call it a consumer quirk. These bricks and booster packs contain figures, it's true, but you don't know exactly what you're buying. There's a range of figures associated with a theme, a setting, an actual published adventure. In this particular lineup, the range contains 44 figures. Sets are sold as individual booster packs or in bricks of eight boxes. I didn't have loads of Pathfinder figures, so I thought I'd pick up a wad of them in a sale. Yes, in a sale. It was worth buying a brick of eight boxes to see what I'd receive. Each box holds four figures. The canny in the audience will already have realized that four times eight equals thirty-two, and it is therefore impossible to buy all forty-four models in this range simply by purchasing a brick of eight boxes. That's where the booster boxes come in. I don't care. Purchasing this brick at a discount was a fast method of gaining a whole bunch of figures on the cheap. The real selling point is that they are all pre-painted. Are they the best models in the world with the most fantastic paint jobs? No, and I don't care about that. All you are looking for on your tabletop are playing pieces robust enough to survive an iron brew tsunami, should the clumsy player shake your table. Iron brew is a Scottish fizzy drink made from girders and the purloined superstructures of vessels that succumbed to the power of the iron brew triangle. Think of the Bermuda Triangle, but in the North Sea under an orange mist. And that is a Caledonian fact. But let us return to the matter of models sold in bricks of boxes. No, I don't like the business model. Buy figures sight unseen, trade duplicates with other enthusiasts, buy endless booster boxes in the hope that you collect that one rare model, go to the online traders and fork out hundreds of banknotes in a hyperinflated marketplace, become an online trader yourself and charge hyperinflated prices, sustaining a ludicrous marketplace. I just want a bunch of figures I can use. And a bargain is a bargain in a sale. If I hate the business model with the fury of a raging bugbear, I hate the higher business model with an even greater fiery passion. Beyond the box, beyond the brick, is a collection of bricks sold by the caseload. If you want all of the figures, buy a case. Retailers are going to order by the caseload or by the pallet of cases. As for regular customers, I suspect only collectors and completionists would purchase a case. Collectors and Completionists is a role-playing game with an endless supply of rulebooks and sourcebooks, many of those supplements ill-described as rare. I don't fault collectors or completionists for gaming mania. That is their business. How you spend your cash is up to you. I have amassed a fair collection of figures over time, but I am not myself a capitalized collector. Marvel in amazement at entire floors of buildings in America, where else? Dedicated to gaming collections. The most elaborate establishment only lacks one feature, a cash register, to go from being a collection to a shop. My jaw dropped as I watched that video. The figures in my non-collector collection are flawed. There are hidden and not-so-hidden repairs. Figures fell off the very high table to the carpet of doom. I've performed emergency surgery on shattered legs, broken arms, skewed swords, and torn tentacles. Let's place emphasis on this point. How you spend your money is your affair. I'm really impressed watching gaming vault videos. They are vaults. For the most part, they have the air of that warehouse about them, the one in Raiders of the Lost Ark. You have expect to spot the Lost Ark itself, crated up midway along the aisles of unopened games next to five copies of Magic Realm. And by unopened, I mean sheathed in the original shrink wrap. I have no objection to display cabinets containing figures mounted on dioramas. Effort goes into the creation of scenes. No effort goes into leaving things in boxes wrapped up in spiderish plastic silken sheets for the better part of eternity. There's this thing in the world of comic books. 
Comics kept in bags, sealed, unopened, unread, never to be read, no longer serve the purpose for which they were originally intended. Slabbing goes further. Take your comic book to a service. I use the term service in its loosest possible sense. Have that comic graded for quality going by the Geneva Accords of 2000 and dumb. Then hand over cash to have that comic encased in a plastic tomb called a slab. You may find that depressing, distressing, or dispiriting as you please. Slabbed comics are plastic tokens, giving rise to an industry, a community of avid counterfeiters and fakers, of course. Graded for quality and slabbed, the comic book may be unslabbed, regraded, retrograded in mercury, unpersoned, trimmed, bleached, airbrushed, slabbed all over again, sold, bought, traded, pushed, filed, stamped, indexed, briefed, debriefed, or numbered. It has a life of its own, and that life is unreadable, having been transformed into cover art. But I have veered off. I'm not here to slab comics or to buy whole cases of miniatures to complete my non-collection. This video is about purchasing a brick of figures in a sale and telling you what I thought of the experience. I didn't have any of these figures, and so I'd already greatly reduced my chance of gaining duplicates. Let's talk about duplicate figures for a second. They are useful in a very obvious way. Your sturdy adventurers are ambushed by a party of one orc. No, you throw a bunch of figures onto the adventurers' swords. I deliberately bought multiple packs of figures for use in crowded dungeons or lofty wizardy towers, so I don't object to receiving duplicate figures in this brick of plastic randomness. Duplicate figures are a certainty, even if buying by the case. The case has been shuffled around somewhat to ensure that you gain at least one copy of every single miniature in the range of 44 models. Reminder, I didn't have any of these Pathfinder miniatures, and they were going cheap in a sale. You are told quite clearly, twice there on the packaging, that you might end up with figures that are not as depicted. Product shown may vary from actual product. There's a fair chance of a high chance of duplicates. That's the whole model of the brick in a business nutshell. But that's not the whole business. You don't have to buy pre-painted figures from WizKids and solid bricks. Any monster figure from any manufacturer will easily stand in for an official Dungeons & Dragons creature. It's a game of the imagination, right? If you get by on description alone, you needn't use figures at all. As far as I'm concerned, these Pathfinder miniatures are for use in Dungeons & Dragons. I don't own Pathfinder rules, just those introductory boxes. An orc is an orc. Unless it is an orc with a K, in which case it is a Games Workshop trademark, or the planet of a Robin Williams lookalike named Mark. Nanu Nanu. I'll spare you the ritual of unboxing these miniatures. No one wants to see that. In curtailed form, as stipulated under international law, we'll move through the process by the magical means of much editing. No, I didn't like the way these were packaged. A plastic shell and bubble wrap. The end result was one of the smaller figures rattling loose in the box. There were no broken figures in the whole brick, but one or two models suffered from bendy spear syndrome. I'm not a fan of plastic shells that cling to the miniature as though this is the last day on our planet. Top tip, pay the plastic shell no mind. Better to destroy the packaging than to break a miniature. We'll start with the duplicates. Here's a major monster. If you're feeling particularly Greek, the beast is known as a chimera, not to be confused with Korean rule, that's the Lil' Kim era. Some say this is the Shimmerer, not to be confused with Chim Chim Cheri. We all love Dick Van Dyke's authentic accent, even if we don't know the location of that accent in time and space. This was the first duplicate out of the box, and I was delighted, as only someone who runs adventures can be. Yes, this is a Game Master's thing, it's a Dungeon Master's requirement. Take two fearsome creatures and sit them to either side of a set of stairs as statues of fearsome creatures. Players never appreciate that sort of dungeon dressing. I can't think why not. There are a few bugbears in the system, and here they are. What to do about a bendy weapon? Leave it as it is, or give it the warm water treatment. Most of those warm water fixes involved unpainted figures. I used hot water on the Waterdeep statue, and that didn't adversely affect the paint job there. Of course I don't see anything wrong in throwing a pair of whites at carefree players. Give their characters something to care about. These would do just fine as assassins or robots. Assassin robots, hmm. 
What do you call duplicate figures? Why, guards, of course. Now they may be dressed in armour and carrying weapons, but these hobgoblins are merely in the banquet hall to keep the peace, right? Yes, I'd prefer half a number of halflings on display here. For legal reasons, they are definitely not hobbits. I suspect a die job is in order for one of these plucky blonde adventurers. I make that five duplicates out of thirty-two figures, and those duplicates are welcome by me, if not by the players. Let's move on. A wraith passes muster as any spectral becloaked character. Painted yellow, it would fit quite well into a Cthulhu game. These orcs are all different, though clearly the same base figure was used as a model with slight variations to create multiple Blood Bowl characters. Did I say Blood Bowl? Dear me. Surely some mistake. Now we come to the Gashly Crumb Tinies. Bees for Basil, killed by bugbears. Why do I like these so much? They are tiny, and players have a liking for playing all manner of pixies. With such a need in mind, at least I don't have to paint the tiny buggers. That's why I like them, not having to paint them. I'm not saying Legolas and Gimli are recreated here as miniatures. The figure on the right looks nothing like Legolas. You'll never know when you need to spring the attack of the flying lizard creature and semi-suspecting players. So what's missing from this set if I'm down by so many figures? There's a nightmare, but I could use any one of several spooky horses on my shells for that. The boar demon could be replaced by all sorts of bulky devilish figures. I have a handful of small dragons that can easily stand in for the blue dragon in this range. Those are the memorable ones that aren't here. This is a shadow, but outside a pathfinder it becomes any spooky floaty thing you want it to be. The Ashen Man is a large cultist monster figure crying out to be included in the final five disastrous minutes of any Cthulhu adventure. Cthulhu is now also available in Pathfinder, Dungeons and & Dragons, and Extra Minty Editions. Speaking of Cthulhu, this distant relative, the Algolfu, is an obvious stand-in for the Dungeons & Dragons equivalent, the Aboleth. Or use it for that flying shark beast you'd like to surprise your land-based players with. This is far and away the best of the bunch. The dragon turtle ambushed me when I opened the box. Apart from seeing the box art, I'd stayed away from images of the figures in this range. Only after opening the last box did I turn to the internet to see the figures I hadn't snared. Just taking this monster out of the box made me realise I had to put a dragon turtle into an adventure. Not necessarily as a villain, perhaps as a character who gives an aquatic lift to standard players. How else are they going to reach those stairs with the two highly detailed statues at the foot of them? He's a storm giant. She's a cloud giant. When they met, sparks flew. Over in the land of dungeons and occasional dragons, there are Wizkids giants that are more giant. I suppose that's why I think of these giants as teenagers. There you have a brick of figures, obtained at a discount, all useful in generic or specific role-playing settings. Do I like the business model? No. Are the figures reasonable? Useful? Absolutely. Will I dive deep into other brick sets of figures? Unlikely. Maybe Starfinder. We'll see.